Hey, Sandra. Hey, Kimmy. Do, 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 do. Who are we? <gasps> the Screaming Diva. You're in the woods. In the woods. You're in Paris Opera House dressing room. That's not yours anymore. Oh. Mine. Sorry, Benjamin Bernheim. Sorry. Yes. And today, yeah? We interviewed da, 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 Sophie Joyce, who is the casting director of the Paris National Opera now. New position. New position, really amazing woman in what she's accomplished in her career so far. Amazing. Amazing. Not only uh, casting director at ENO, Young Headed Artist. Young Artist Program at the Metropolitan Opera after that. And now and the casting director in, at Paris Opera. So, wow. wow. Power woman. Yeah. Man. And in charge of so many young singers' lives and their careers um, for so many years. Yes. And now here at the Paris Opera, and she's doing great things here. And the Paris Opera is maybe not allowed to perform with audiences, but they are still capturing performances, recording them, filming, filming them. And yeah, we wanted to know how the pandemic affected her job now. How does that work? And being married you? to an opera singer. Ha ha ha. Lucky her. Actually, well, lucky like, him. She's amazing. Exactly. Opera mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. Job, husband, life. Yep. So a lot of invaluable information for young artists and singers out there. So take a listen. Yeah. Take a look. There was Just some great info there. Even for singers, you know, I think even singers like me, I was like, oh, I didn't know that. That was really yeah. interesting. I'm glad I knew that information. And to be honest about it all, she no was joke. quite honest. So there you go. And a woman in a very strong position. Yeah. So we have a good clip. I'm going to go this side today. Yeah. This side? Yeah. We'll see if that works. <laughs> all right. Stay safe, Check everybody. It out, everybody. Stay Here's safe. Clip. Ciao. You know, you need to get your team around you, even if it's just one person that you really trust, like the trusted ears. That's if you can find that as soon as possible, then it will, you know, really stand you in good stead. Cheers! Hello! Cheers! To the Screaming Divas! Yay! Welcome! Well, this is the, the queen of the Screaming Divas here, you know, Hoya to Ho and all that stuff. <laughs> it's okay. so good to see your face. I know. It's been so long. I know. I, I remember it well. No, that was crazy times at ENO. That was crazy, but, but fun. I remember. I mean, I love Gwen so much, you know, Gwen and Stacy. So it was a good time, but it's good to see yeah. your face. The people need to know that we're in the same building right now, you and I, Sophie, six floors apart. Six love floors, it. Six floors. This is a first for us, right, Carrie? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Same building. Mm -hmm. Yes. We we could have been sitting in the same room, Sophie and I, but then we both would have had to have masks on. And we wanted to see your lovely face. Oh, so yes. yeah. Are you in your dressing room? I am, which is now not my dressing room anymore. It's Benjamin Bernheim's. I know. Because our Aida's is kaput finito. <laughs> it's fini. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how are you? Yay! Yay! <laughs> In your new job. Yay. This is too ridiculous. <laughs> Welcome to the Screaming Demon shenanigans. <laughs> Everyone's going to think, why is Sophie laughing so much? <laughs> <laughs> because it's medicine. Laughing is good for you. And yeah, because you have Prosecco from Marks and Spencer, <laughs> by the way. m and &S. Bought in the airport the day that I landed. Oh my gosh, I love that so much. Wuppertal, Germany. <laughs> Cheers. The m and in Wuppertal. Brilliant. Well, you know, that's where I, I gave Sophie also a, an m and bag just because I wanted her to feel a little bit like home, you know, so. Oh, my home. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. So how you doing? You, you're in a new job now here in Paris at the Paris Opera. How's it going? Mm -hmm. You know, it's just straightforward. You come in, you do the operas now. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's it, changed. Unfortunately, it has been um, a challenge, so shall we say. Yes. A little thing called a pandemic. Ooh, 
I, I, originally I wasn't supposed to be here now. I was, I was supposed to start um, with Alexander this coming season. Right. So then but everything changed and we've been here since the beginning of this season. Wow. Sort of. But um, you accepted the job before the pandemic happened, correct? Yeah. Okay. So actually, I've been doing the job in some form since, uh, where are we now? Since autumn of 2019. Okay. So at that time, I was still at the Met with okay. the young artists. And then um, the whole world exploded. Exploded. <laughs> and I did the lockdown um, in the UK. Oh, so okay. Sort of working from the actually there was a period where I was working from the UK for the Met with the young <laughs> artists just finishing off there was like a few weeks where they were finishing off their season so we had these late night zoom meetings where it was like midnight my time and oh I was, my goodness <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, yeah yeah I'm awake I'm awake I'm good I'm good <laughs> so did you actually move in the pandemic from your home in the UK to Paris yeah um Luckily, I it was quite straightforward. Because okay, great. So you haven't had to move your whole home then from the UK to no. France. Okay, that's great. But moving out from New York during the pandemic was a bit more of a challenge. Oh my god! <laughs> because, or well, I left uh, thinking I'll just go back in a month's time. Right. You know, well, it'll be over by then. <laughs> no. Little did we know. Okay. And then I realized, no, I'm, I, I mean, I don't know. I couldn't, I didn't know when I could go back. I still don't know when I can go back. So in the end, I had to organize for um, a removal company to just come in and pack all my stuff up a bit in storage. Wow. Oh my gosh. They, they kept they kept saying, so you'll be there, right, on the day. So that when we have any questions, you'll be there. And I was like, no, I, I, I cannot stress this enough. <laughs> I cannot be there. <laughs> so... Oh, so, oh my God. So your but whole I, life in New York is packed up in a storage unit. Yes. And can you imagine what this means? I have like a whole wardrobe of clothes <laughs> that I don't have access to. Oh, no. It's going to be no. like Christmas when I can have it all back. It will be. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it will be like a whole brand new wardrobe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I want to backtrack. Okay. <laughs> you are head of casting here in Paris now. Yeah. Super cool job. Before that, you were in charge of the young artist at uh, the Metropolitan Opera. Before that, you were also head of casting at English National, National Opera. How did you, let's go before that, how did you even get into this business? Well, I, hmm, kind of by accident, the whole opera side. Okay. <laughs> I um, studied music, I played the piano, and okay. I went to university and while I was, I already knew that I didn't want to pursue performance as a career because I had figured out that one, I wasn't as talented as the other people, my other peers. And two, I didn't have that drive to, to you know, work so that I could be on the same level as them. And I, I just didn't get, I w the nerves compared to the joy of performing, the nerves sort of one <laughs> so I already knew that but then when I was at uni I thought oh what am I going to do and I had the idea to become an artist manager oh, oh okay I thought, well this is a way to work with artists because I really I you know I love music I felt really committed to making music happen in some form being part of that process so I applied to agencies and I got an interview at IMG oh cool oh yeah, and I, w I was with the instrumentalist department, but they didn't give me the job. So they, <laughs> so they passed my CV onto the vocal division and they called me and asked if I would be interested in coming to interview for them. And it was for a job doing travel, logistics, you know, all the like visas, all of the nitty gritty of mm -hmm. the practical thing for the vocal division. So I did that. And that was at, when the singers were coming to perform in London, they often wouldn't have any family there. So they would give their tickets to the agent and the mm -hmm. agent 
would sometimes invite me. And so I would get that, I would always go along thinking, oh, this is, this is a fun part of the job. Mm -hmm. And that's, I, that's where I, I got the opera bug because I was, I, I mean, it was amazing. Some of the performances I could go to. And also what I realized, and I don't know really what this says about me, but I realized that I found the people who worked in the vocal division much more exciting and <laughs> um, fun than the people who worked in the instruments. So yeah, exactly. I know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Those singers are slightly are slightly off kilter, and you're married to one, so <laughs> yeah. I'll just, just say that. And yeah. you yeah. you jumped right into that big boat. <laughs> <laughs> and at one point, I did say, uh, "I'm I'm never gonna get involved with a singer, never." <laughs> now I'm married to one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but you know what? He's Ian's, he's not the normal singer. You know, <laughs> he's really he's nice. He's he's. A normal person and you know he watches football at our or, or yeah. He's, yeah he's he's welsh right or scottish <gasps> scottish <laughs> at least he didn't say he's english he would much rather be welsh <laughs> sorry <Andy. laughs> in some form sorry. i think <laughs> yeah oh, oh my God. God. that's hysterical so. So then how did you transition from that into working your way up in an opera company at ENO? Is that was that the bridge? ENO? Yeah. Okay. So well after that that job doing travel, then I got promoted. I was then assisting the the head of the vocal division. And th at that point I was working with uh, some really exciting artists. And I, I was thinking, oh, this, you know, this is really what I want to do, because it's I was just sort of amazed by the ver like the variety of everyday life working right. with, you know. Um, but I thought oh, I don't really know enough about it. I really want I need to I need to get to know the repertoire. I need to know how it all works. So at that point, I thought I, actually I would really like to work for an opera house. And um, so someone put me in touch with a company manager at ENO who needed an assistant. Okay. So then it went from there. And then I ended up staying for ten years. <laughs> I love that. But I mean, you really got to know how an opera company functions and works and yeah, yeah it was everything. really helpful from that point. Yeah, especially because in the company office there, I'd, it all works slightly differently in different opera houses, but mm -hmm. we would do we were really involved with scheduling and we were the, the first contact for all the singers. So I, I really got to know what a, a singer has to go through in, in the whole process of, you know, from the beginning of rehearsals to the final performance. Wow, so that that was really fascinating. And that's yeah. where Carrie met you. Yeah, yes, that's Oscar. Where we met. Oscar, doing the biggest fall backwards of my entire life, <gasps> and you yeah. did it brilliantly. But you know, ever with you all had hired um, this brilliant fight master, and because oh, yeah. of him, he taught me how to do it so safely that I prefer to go back now. All the other Toscas, I'm like, no, I want to go back because it's safer. He taught me that it's safer. For my whole body and my head and everything to go backwards wow. and so now I'll, i ha i'm fine i mean it's still a little like all oh, sweet jesus here we go but <laughs> part of the character think about that i yeah. mean hey if, if tosca leapt so easily you know you would you'd be a little worried about it so yeah, you would. That's a, true. <laughs> I'm a little nervous about shit. but it's true i told that to carrie because <clears throat> she came to me before she she did her first tosca and she's mm -hmm. like Okay, girl, talk to me about Tosca. Help me out. What do I need to do? And I'm like, the jump. <laughs> the jump. Yeah, but how do you prepare for that? How do you have that hanging over you all night? Oh no, I'm going to have to jump. No, I think like when you're in the heat of the moment, you just do it. But to actually have to do it in rehearsal, and I will never forget the cover because I really didn't want to do it at all. I was like, no, just fire me now. I don't want to do this. And seriously, I really don't want to do this. And the cover was like, I'll do it. And of course, like that instant soprano mm -hmm. competition yeah. was like, <laughs> <gasps> and she totally did it and she was safe and fine. And I'm like, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> but you hear so many stories. That's that's the problem with Tosca. They're, they Nobody teaches them all these things. It's like knife fights in operas and jumping and all that. It's if you know it and if you've rehearsed it and practiced it and you have a routine and a technique for doing it, it's gonna be safe. Oh, but you hear so many sopranos rolling their ankle, 
or breaking a knee or breaking their wrist because right. they fall forward or they hit their head. Yep. If you fall backwards, you, you land on your bum, you tuck your head, you know, the bum is for most of us, at least the most padded part of our body. So <laughs> true. But you know, you also taught me something really important to make sure the padding is the correct padding because if correct. it's not the correct padding, then you can also hurt yourself, whether you're falling, falling forwards or backwards as well. And so, look before you go. Always. So many people don't do that. They just jump and then, oops, well, we forgot to put the pad down tonight. It's happened, Sophie. It's happened when I've been to shows and it wasn't enough padding or they that day, oops, well, they put it a little to the right or to the mm -hmm. left. So you make it part of the routine. You look where you're going to go because yep. safety is so important yep. in opera. Who knew? So, but Kerry, so how did you do? Because if you're falling backwards, so you just find a way dramatically. To well, just, uh, yeah. you always have to walk up because you know yeah. you have to. Usually, the set is on a on an angle, so you have to walk up. You look and turn around, and then it's this, and then boom, go. And whenever you look, I whenever I looked, I always yelled out to the guys. I'm like, hey, and they're like, hey, and then I would turn around, <laughs> or they'd laugh Preparation. at me because I'd say something like that, and then. Uh, and then I knew yeah, because I mean, she wouldn't, Tosca wouldn't just walk up there and jump. You know, that's true. you would think, wouldn't anybody that, sorry, this is a dark subject, but if you're going to kill yourself, I'm sorry, you're not just going to say, hey, okay, bye, peace out. I'm going to go and just, you think about it, you know, and, and Tosca is the same thing. And, and when you prepare, you're thinking about it, but you're also preparing and, yeah. and Carrie's right. You make sure that there's somebody there. And if there's nobody there, then you find another way to jump, like do what Caballé did, was like, Scarfia Von Dia Dio, and she walks off stage. <laughs> I mean, oh, but we just got off on a, we just got off on a damn Okay, okay, I know we did, sorry. Yeah, get us talking about ourselves and forget it. I mean, Lord have mercy. We're passionate about Tosca. We're singers, you know, come on. I love it. I love um, the fact that you're now, that they, this is a thing, it's like, make sure you fall backwards, that's it. I'm a fall backwards. Yeah, but, but do it the right way. You yeah, got to yeah. You got to tuck your head, your chin to your chest, right, mm -hmm. Carrie? Yep. Mm -hmm. Put your hands behind your head. So I always prepare. Oh, Scott, be a bon dia dia, and I put my hand up. It looks really effective in the audience, but yeah. they don't know that as I'm falling. Uh, you then. It's a, oh, now I gave away. No, I didn't have to do that. Oh, I just, just fall like I'm Jesus on the cross with the head. Mm -hmm. But you have to be relaxed too when you do it. You do. If you're tense, then you right. can like. It's like a diet. How do you do that? How can you just say, relax? Because because I know what that pat, I guess, because I the first time I did it, I wasn't. And then I knew what the padding felt like. And then once I knew that, I knew what I was falling into. And I knew that I had these guys that are, uh, that, <laughs> that I didn't bounce in case I bounced off, which always made me laugh. I'm like, no, that's not gonna happen. But if I did, there are these big guys that are standing right there, uh -huh. you know? So I'd bounce into yeah. them. See, mm -hmm. things you learn. So okay, okay. yeah, 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 blah, blah, blah. We okay. digress. But so you, you know. were able to work with John McMurray at ENO, who I think every singer I know that's ever worked with him loved him, not only because um, of him hiring these singers, but he also helped them build their careers as far as he looked for the longevity of the career and what repertoire was going to help them do that. Um, was there anything that you, no, I don't even know if you liked him or not, but was there anything that you took from him any advice that you still use today in your job? Oh yeah, I mean, actually John, so funnily, John worked at IMG when I worked there. We didn't work very much together, but he was there. So then when he went to ENO, I was actually starting my job in the company office at the same time. Cool. So it was really, it was really nice to know someone already. But um, no, when he, so he asked me to go and work with him when he needed some, an assistant. And I said, okay, I'll come, but you have to teach me everything you know about casting. <laughs> and I, yeah, think, lucky I, you. I, I know, lucky he actually you. agreed and he he did. He he, I invo he included me in like most of the meetings that he had. Wow. I was kind of, I didn't, I never really expected that. He, he really did mentor people, not just me, but you know, young artists and artists, like in different stages of their careers. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the, the thing that has stuck with me that what you're saying is this, this career trajectory that he was so interested in mm -hmm. and the dialogue with the singer. So not just having, you know, his own thoughts and hoping that it worked out, but mm -hmm. really get to know the singer and um, plotting a sort of 
path with them. And uh, that's and that's something that I think is, you know, just really essential, especially for young artists mm. to, to get the experience they need so that they can sit, still be singing roles, you know, well into the 40s, let's say 50s, 60s. So well, just... however long you want to. Yeah, I think yeah. that's the way I always say it. Mm -hmm. You choose when you want to stop. Exactly. Not your voice tells you you need to stop, you know, yeah. and yeah. that's. Uh, that's a that's with people with smart advice and and following and listening to their voice and and you're you're kind of like that that person having been now let's go to the next job having been the head of the young artist program at the mm -hmm. metropolitan opera all of these young artists careers in their lives really they're were in your hands their voices I know. massive responsibility <laughs> and and you know, one of the things that came up a lot was, you know, you need to get your team around you, even if it's just one person that you really trust, like the trusted ears, that's, if you can find that as soon as possible, then it will, you know, really stand you in good stead. Because it, they, they obviously knew their voices and were getting to know their voices and being, trying things out, but they, just to be able to try something and to be able to do something where, you know, it's going to stretch them a little bit because mm -hmm. the stretch factor is also quite important. Mm -hmm. And to have someone giving them feedback who they trust, I think is like key, really. Huge. Yeah. Do you feel a responsibility being in charge of their careers and all of that? Is it, a, is it like a heavy? Yeah. Burden? I mean, it was one of those things I you, you could never, you could never, stop thinking about it or and you can never do enough because you're always mm -hmm. thinking oh, I could what opportunity could I get for this person and is, is this person with the really with the right singer or, uh, singing teacher or should I yeah. could I find a better coach for them because mm -hmm. it's so you know young artists programs can be amazing because they they you in, they're introduced to this team of professionals and given ex stage experience hopefully Right. So it, if that singer clicks with those coaches and the singing teachers and the roles that they're given, amazing. But if they don't, and you know, who knows whether they will or not, then it's, it's really difficult. And that singer and the head of the program need to find a way to, you know, find a team of people that they do click with or they do where they do get what they're saying and a language of a, a, a universal language that they both speak, you know, so to speak. Exactly. I love yeah. that. That's hard though. Finding that key to unlock young singers can be really difficult because yeah. I mean, but you locked. even when, sometimes even when it's just like one short experience that can unlock something. Like you mm. know, when you came and worked with them, Sandra, like they they were still talking about some of the things that you said like, like a year later. Oh no. It, it's like you plant the seed. No, corrupting young minds again. Yes. Ah. No, but I know, I do know there was one soprano in particular who was who was slightly shut down, yeah. and I learned this from my old voice teacher Ruth Falcon. You have to find the language and the description that vibrates with them, and sometimes you have to say the same thing twenty different ways, yeah. and they might get it the twentieth time. It, the way you describe it or what you want and you have to be in a way a psychiatrist don't you yeah and the, i mean also there are a lot of times where that someone had said something but they weren't ready to take that piece of information at that point yes and then sure. you know a year later they were they were like oh now i remember that's what mm -hmm. that person was trying to say and now i can use it and you know take uh -huh it. moments yeah, yeah. i know I love that you think that it's not just one person because the programs that have just one teacher or one coach for all of these kids never made sense to me because if that like what you all are saying if that doesn't resonate with that singer then that singer's lost for the amount of time that they're in the program. Yeah, I mean I feel like if there is one singing teacher, then that singing teacher really needs to be involved in the recruitment process. <laughs> they need to know. Yes. <laughs> they need to know that they can work together, that it's mm -hmm. gonna be a good fit. Otherwise right. it could just be oh, you know waste of time for everybody. Yeah. Well it's yeah. like a marriage. People don't realize that that 
as singers, when you are going and looking for a new voice teacher or finding this person, you are trusting them with your whole life, your whole career. Yeah. And you have to completely trust them because if you don't, you're not going to advance. And it's, it's like a marriage. There's going to be ups and downs. And if it's not a good fit, even if they're the best person for you vocally, bye. Uh, Mm -hmm. did, you, how, did you change singing teachers did you how was it for you to you well i i was with um i when i was in the young artist program i was with uh ruth falcon and she worked and she worked and she re i really got her and and then at some point it didn't work and it stopped working and like you said i was afraid i was afraid to to move forward mm -hmm. because i was afraid that of, of the unknown. And so many singers are afraid of that. And I had a wonderful coach and I was very lucky that I had a coach. And he said, trust your instincts, Sandra, you know how to sing, you know what you're doing. And that for me was the biggest light bulb moment. I do know what I'm doing. <laughs> and that's the biggest thing I find for singers, that moment when you trust yourself and you don't rely on anyone else when you walk on stage, but yourself. Yeah then I think you make the most progress. But how about you, Carrie? You've, um, I had, you've had a different uh, Yeah, I had a different one. I mean, I had, um, by the time I hit the university before I started the Young Art Artist Program with Domingo in DC, um, I was in vocal trauma because uh, I ran a karaoke bar over the summer before I came back to um, university and, you know, ended up in, the beginning of vocal trouble. So I had to find somebody. And then that person who helped rebuild the voice has been my main teacher for the entire ride. Now, when I changed to soprano, I was living in New York and um, I was told to go work with Diana Soviero through that transition. And I did, and that was a wonderful, I actually had a wonderful mix because I had my foundation teacher, Dr. Kimberly Moon, but then I also had Diana Soviero who sung all this repertoire that I knew eventually I would be singing. So it was a wonderful mix. I've always said it takes a village. It's not just one person. And I have to say both of those teachers in my life always said, if you have to call me and ask me to warm you up, if you have to call me to try to fix this, 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 then I didn't do my job. You need to know how to, you're going to be on the road by yourself. You need to know how to do this without having a meltdown. So, I mean, yeah. there are, sometimes there are issues are like, this spot isn't working. Why can't I get through this? If I can't yeah. figure it out, that's a whole different thing. But, you know, to have In somebody general. have a crutch, I didn't need a, I, they didn't want to be that crutch. And I'm so grateful for that training that I didn't need that. Yeah. That's the greatest gift I think a voice teacher can give any student is to say, you know what, I've given you all the information that I have now go and do it on your own. Because a lot of, as you know, Sophie, there's a lot of ego in this business and a lot of teachers want you to need them. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh my God. Right. <laughs> Am I right, Carrie? Yeah. And I think the greatest thing any teacher can do is just say, you know what, go and do it, do it. And you learn by doing it at sink or swim, you know, and exactly. yeah, yeah, that's the thing experience. I mean, without actually trying to do it, it's all just theory, isn't it? And unless you're, until you're on the stage, try, actually getting, singing all the notes of a whole role. Of a whole role. Whenever we get on back on stage. So that's just another question now, isn't it? I know the real, you, I mean, with, so you've done it all in a, and I think I'm correct in saying that you've done it all as far as positions within an opera company, except general director, correct? <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> Really? Is it not on your radar? Is that, do you want, have any interest in doing that at all? No. 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 Do you have a preference of whether, like, would you rather be running a young artist program or do you like being the artistic administrator or the casting director? Oh. I know they call it different terms in different countries. That's the thing. I mean, general director, I like working with the singers too much to, to want to, to be the general director. There's so much else involved. I mean, it's, oh. No, yeah. I that. especially here in France, right? All the, the, the yeah. government funding unions, and the unions. Oof. So talk, so talk to us. So say Alexandre Neve, who is now the new general director here in Paris says, right, we're going to do Tosca just because we've yeah. been talking about it. Yeah. How do you cast an opera? Mm -hmm. Right. Well, so when Alexander would say we're going to do Tosca, he would usually would usually have 
an idea of team in mind. So he would have an idea about who's going to direct it. Say we're talking about a new production. Mm -hmm. Or he'd have an idea about who's going to sing Tosca. So there would usually be like a something that's to, you know, start with. Okay. Or a conductor. And then we we would start from that place. So if it was the director who was the sort of catalyst for the project, then I would talk with the director about their ideas and talk, you know, just a very general conversation about what they're thinking for uh, casting. Okay. And then from there, I would start, you know, gathering options and it would be very much discussing with Alexander ideas and who do we who would we think would work well with this person mm. and mm. You know, and at some point the other members of the team would would also join in the discussion so if we started with the director then the conductor you know would then come on board and I would then they would be involved in the discussion as well but the a lot of it would be Alexander and me working through options Okay. And then discussing those with the director and the conductor. Um, so it's a long process. Yeah. 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 And it sounds quite, you know, we'll just discuss it with the director and the conductor, everybody be happy, and then that's done. But, you know, a lot of the time, that what the director's looking for is very different from what the conductor needs and so then so we have to go through sort of a range of ideas before we can get something which you know is satisfies the various requirements of that particular um production um and you know auditions can be involved working sessions to try and introduce these people to the particular singers um, but then other times it could be really easy. It could be just like, we've, we, we've got this idea. We here are all the people that we think would be great. We know they're available. We've spoken to their agents. What do you think? And they might say, yeah, sounds great. Okay. So it, yeah, it, it depends. There's quite a lot of different factors. Yeah, availability uh, is a big one. Or <laughs> at least it used to be a big one, but. Oh no, it's, it, yeah, it's, it still it's is. Big. I like yeah. I like hearing that. And I think that's really important for a lot of singers to hear that don't know the answer to this question, because a lot of times singers take things so personally, you know, they had a great audition, they sing really well, they had a great working session, but then whatever the problem was, it just didn't gel, it wasn't the right fit. And it's not necessarily because of their talent or because of who they are, or yeah. whatever, it's just there's so many moving pieces to this puzzle that um, I, I love hearing that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's so many times where where we've got great options for one right. role, and we're thinking, I mean, it would be amazing to have any of these people, but we have to choose one, and for this particular reason, or with this particular team, this is this is the one we think is going to be a better fit. Yes. But um, yeah, I know with young artists, especially with young artists, when they're just starting out, they're like, oh, I did a good audition, like, why why am I not getting anything? Oh, but right. you know it doesn't it it might just be that that person's thought oh that was a good audition and then that you're there you're they're in their mind yes and later on they'll think oh i remember that person who came yeah. and sang, that's the person that we need for this mm -hmm. but so, you, sorry but you put you point out a um make a really great point there and i'll never forget finally being an established artist sitting in santa fe where everyone and their mother all of the casting agents are there listening to their young artists sing like death by aria yeah. and <laughs> I, remember, I remember sitting behind some big wigs in the business and I, of course i'm like leaning over like watching to see what they're writing down on the little forms and these forms stay in their offices for five years maybe just Keep going. as they can go back so that's why even if you are you really need to know that when you walk out there and sing that it's a good day that I'm going to nail this and sing this. If you are not feeling well, it is worth just not singing that day and then making appointments to sing with these directors at a, at a later date, because this will stay with you for yeah. a long time. Especially when you've only got one aria. That's the yeah. thing. I mean, one chance. Brutal. Yeah. Um, I know Spade Jenkins, he said to me, I, I sang, oh, Carrie knows this. He's rough, Sam. <laughs> he was rough. I was a young artist and I sang for him probably an aria that I should not have at that point, which was once again, Tosca. 
at 25 years old. And I remember, I remember him saying, you're not ready to sing this. And he never, ever hired me. It was always in his memory that Sandra sang something for me that she wasn't ready to sing. And I learned that because he said, Sandra, you shouldn't sing Bicidarte if you're not ready to sing Tosca. And I thought that's huge. What amazing feedback though. Right. It is. It's unfortunate that I never sang there, but (laughs) (laughs) but learning experience and Gail Robinson was in charge of the program then. And she said, Sandra, do you hear what he said? Take that advice and really run with it. Because if you're singing for the general director of a major opera house, you're not going to give him dangle this little carrot and then say, oh, but I'm sorry, if you give me Tosca, I'd have to say no. Mm-hmm. Exactly. I mean, I think that's another thing is make it easy for the casting people to know how to cast you. Right now. Right now. I mean, and I've sort of changed my thoughts on this over the last couple of years, because I used to say sing roles that you can be cast in now. And I, I, I still feel that. But working with the young artists in a bit more detail than that, but I can't show my voice. So, you know, I've got a big voice and I can't, I can't just sing, you know, these, these like small roles, mm-hmm. which can, yeah, can be an issue. Mm-hmm. But I think you, I think there's a way of doing it. I think you have to be really strategic about what you're offering and you can offer things which you, which show a little bit of, you know, potential, but don't go too far with it. I mean, you know, singing an aria from from a role that you you wouldn't get near to singing it's probably not such a good idea um so yeah i think there's a strategy that that um that can be in place that can you know really help young artists to sort of navigate the whole auditioning thing and repertoire so what do you what do you look for what are the what would you say are the top three things now as a casting director not as the head of the young artist program what top three things should singers really concentrate on when singing for instance for you um well what do i look for i look for the general just the timbre of the voice is i'm just listening out for that and then, you know, is this a big voice? How does this voice carry? What, you know, what are the qualities of the voice? But then technique, how technically secure is this person? If I offer them this role, will do? can I feel confident that they'll be able to sing 10 performances of it, you know, in three week period <laughs> and still have a voice at the end of it? <laughs> um, and then, the, I mean, the third and probably most important thing is what, are they communicating? What uh, do they have something to say? Musicality, artistry, what is it that they can bring to it that, you know, that's unique to them? Um, so th- I think those are the three things and I think they all ha- impact on one another, if you see what it means. So if, yeah. if you don't have the technique, but you have a gorgeous voice and you have something to say, you, you, it's going to be harder to communicate that because you need the as you two know you need the technique to deliver well you don't want a cookie it sounds like you don't want a cookie cutter kind of voice either you want you want somebody that stands out vocally and that is themselves yeah i mean casting for major roles here now you need they it needs to be something special they need they need there needs to be that unique thing Mm -hmm. that not everybody can just do do sure. the same mm-hmm. um and that i mean that's slightly different for young artists because there could be a period where they are a bit cookie cutter because they're still figuring out exactly yeah you know how to who they are even give that what's unique to them with their technique and their voice as it is all in progress how has the can we go back to the pandemic how has the pandemic changed your job as far as casting and future and because nobody really knows it's constantly changing all the time is that what your day is is just putting out fires for changes yeah i mean unfortunately a lot of a lot of it has been about dealing with covid related problems okay (laughs) um you know there's a lot of extra planning just getting singers here as sandra knows (laughs) is a challenge 
in itself. And then oh, um, <laughs> that's a whole nother Screaming Divas episode. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Then to Paris, that's the first obstacle. And then when you're here, like all the tests and the diff, you know, the different restrictions that we've, we've got to keep the all the health protocol, you know, as safe yeah. as possible for everybody. But it makes it difficult, you know, singers have to sing with masks and all this. Um, so that's a challenge. And then when we have to, when we're not allowed to open to the public, then sorting out, you know, can are we able to stream this or can do we have to cancel the productions? You know, uh, it's it it has <laughs> it's been it's it's a lot. But the you know, it's I mean, it's amazing that we we still rehearsing to the streamings that we've done and just having the the Faust um, zits today, listening to people yeah. singing on stage with the orchestra. Oh. <laughs> I'm so jealous. <laughs> no, but, I mean, the, the rumor bill in this in singer town is, um, you know, if you have a contract with Paris coming up, it's probably going to happen. So you better get your booty ready to okay. sing because you are making things happen there. So that that's a good rumor to have. Yeah. Your- government funding too really helps and having a government backing the arts here uh exactly. has to be a big part of it am i wrong well no i mean we we have the support from the government and so we need to be ready if the government turn around and say tomorrow oh then then the numbers are much better we can open up the cultural institutions again we need to be ready to go we can't say oh sorry we're going to need another couple of yeah. months mm-hmm. to get things ready again so we and while while it's like that we have to just keep preparing and make sure we're ready Wow. Uh, unbelievable. So your job is almost like three times as hard as it normally is, or 10 times as hard. I don't know what number. Well, I mean, in a way, there's some things that have been easier, what, you know, talk about availability. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we, True, had, isn't it? we had loads of uh, cast change of cancellations because of various things, like either people couldn't get here or they took a test and it was positive. They didn't realize that they didn't have any symptoms or people were ill mm-hmm. and we, but uh, luckily we knew that we, you know, there would be singers available that we could call upon. But at the end of last year it was, I mean, it still is in some ways m- more challenging because just getting them into the country <laughs> became more <really long. laughs> Talking about cunt getting in and out, are you able to go home to see your family at all with all the lockdowns happening? Um, I think I could, but I would have to, quarantine when I got there for two weeks and then coming back I would have to quarantine for a week so it would be <laughs> that's your whole vacation time <laughs> yeah. yeah and tomorrow there there might be more news coming tomorrow we hear yeah. so uh, here in Paris could you imagine the singers from like 50 years ago like Maria Callas Renata Tibaldi dealing with this I mean it I know I mean the amount I, I was marveling at, at how the singers have been dealing with it because it's a stressful job as it is. Yeah. Especially in, you know, today with the, the amount of travel and everything. But, and all the demands that we're, that are put on singers, you know, different types of production and everything. But then to add all this worry about testing and, uh, you know, is it going to happen? Is it not going to happen? Is someone going to be ill? And then I have to self-isolate for two weeks because I might be a case contact. Oh, the stress. Travel restrictions. And I mean. Unbelievable. Oh. Um, have you had, I don't know if you can answer this question, but have you had any artists or anyone that you have asked to come work there that said, I don't feel safe. I'm not, I don't want to come yet until we have vaccines. Uh, there, there were a couple of people who said, um, actually, uh, it was when the end of last year when our numbers in Paris were particularly high. Mm. They said, actually, you know, I hope you understand, but I don't feel safe traveling. Okay. But, you know, got to. I have, a, I have a silly question. You, you had mentioned before larger voices. Yeah. What do you do with a young artist that has a dramatic voice? Because it really seems like there's a lack of, in my opinion, there's a lack of dramatic voices out there right now. Yeah, and I'm I'm interested to know uh, a bit more about your how your path from young singer. But I will answer the question. 
Um, well, what guidance would you give them if you have a larger dramatic voice? If you know you're going to be a Wagnerian, you know? Yeah. You, I mean, the thing is, it's all about the career trajectory again. So it's about finding roles that you can do now so to build up the experience so that by the time you you know you're getting into your prime you're then ready you have the experience I think I think that's the thing it's quite difficult to um, explain it to young artists because when they sing and someone says oh my god your, your voice is incredible it's so big you're you, you're you know you're a Botan you're a Brunhilde then they they they, they think, oh, okay, that's what I am. So when will I be able to do that? And so then they start looking at it, obviously, but but then they, they're, they're just thinking, well, when can I do that? Because that's obviously what people hear. The thing is, as you know, the they need to get the miles on the clock to experience wise. <laughs> so that when yeah. they do it, they, they will still have a voice at the end of the night. <laughs> <laughs> it's true so, isn't it yeah and it's that thing and i it's often really tricky when the larger voices audition because you i'm thinking depending on what they sing i'm thinking i i i want to employ you but you need to give me a bit of a hint as to smaller roles that we can give you in the next few years so that you know five years or 10 years down the line, you, you're ready for all the big stuff. Mm -hmm. It's like, an investment, isn't it? It's an investment. I mean, and I think the thing is people, they singers go too fast or they say yes to things that people have offered and they just don't have the experience to get them through it in a way where they're still singing healthily because they're either, you know, beefing up the sound or they're, I don't know, just falling into all these like potential pitfalls that they don't, they don't ha know how to, you know, maneuver. So, and then that, I think there are loads of voices who are sort of over before they have began. Absolutely. Well, Carrie and I, we both in a way had to, to as I always say, we had to cook longer because yeah. Carrie started as a mezzo, but she knew that she was going to become a soprano, but she had to, she had to do the whole process to get, you know, do you always need that? that? No, I didn't. No, I really wanted to stay in Mezzo. I was really hoping as I got into my 30s, you know, the voice, bigger voices settle later in their 30s. Yeah. And so I was hoping it would drop so that I could sing those big Mezzo Verity roles. That's what I wanted. The pool is smaller there. I mean, there's not that many of them. And the voice was like, um, I don't think so. I think you're going to go up. And then, the, you know, with Marilyn Horn's help, the ball started rolling to do um, soprano. And I thought, why am I jumping into this pool with a million people like Sandra? Like, this is craziness. Because you're so great at it. But I, you know, can we just ask, sorry about big voices, but yeah. this goes back to what you said about auditioning, because I'm one of those people that can sit in the middle, that can sit in the crack and sing these fishing roles. So if I walked into audition for you, I have a myriad of options that I can offer, but that also confuse people because yes, I can sing Mozart. Yes, I can sing Puccini and Verdi, and then it's confusing and I can sing bel canto. So how do I show you what I want? Does that make yeah, you sense? Don't, because you don't fit in a box and, and in this in business, if you don't really fit in, in a, a box, Can't it's confusing. So yeah. yeah. Well, um, what would be the answer to that? Well, I think you just, uh, I think you'd have to imagine what it is that you, you would sing best in that house and, mm -hmm. and build it from there. So make that the sort of the center of the audition. So then have things that aren't too like crazy. Uh, yeah. That aren't too far away from that thing. Yeah. Um, because yeah. If, if you, yeah, it's when there's a, you have one role and then you have another role which is so like a really different voice type. Like not like the suspicion thing is this you can mm. there are certain roles that you can imagine. Yeah, okay, mm. this could be either mezzo or soprano. Yeah, that's the whole thing in itself. But sometimes you get people coming in with I don't know, it's like a contralto <laughs> aria and then a, a really clear soprano aria, and you're like right. Right. <laughs> so you're saying if you're singing at the Bastille, which is a barn, yeah, you know, bring the roles that are probably a little on the lighter side because you have to sing in a barn. Whereas if you're coming to some place like the Canadian Opera Company, which is really 
a smaller theater and, and all wood and really great acoustics maybe bring your more dramatic roles. Yeah, and mean, you have to in a, yeah, in the pool of things that you you know you know is your repertoire anyway. Mm -hmm. I mean, because some singers that because you can always go to too uh, too far with with these ideas, can't you? Like some singers will be yeah. like, right, I will only sing Handel in a big place, and then, then I will sing, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Verdi in a small place. You're like, oh no, <laughs> no, 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 no. But Carrie, you manage that very well. You really, yeah. you, and and it also has to do with, and this is a lot of singers they don't realize that you can't sing Brunhilde followed by Tosca followed by, you know, I don't know, I'm Neris. <laughs> and you have to look at, at Maria Callas said the voice is in an elevator, you know, and you have to look at the, the arc. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. well, I mean, speaking of auditions, that's sometimes it's really obvious when a singer ha has never sung any of the other arias after the first aria. You're like, have you, have you done this before? <laughs> okay, I did that. I did that one time. One, one time. Song. I put I put one what? aria on there that I'd never sung before in an audition, and it was one of the big, big, big auditions in this in the world. And uh, I walked on a stage, and I yeah, and the I knew who asked for it, and I was like, I hate you for life for asking for that aria. <laughs> and how'd it go? You, you it was a hot damn mess. I couldn't wait to run off that stage. I could not wait to run, oh, no. and I never wanted to walk in that building again. It was horrible. But yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, I yeah, you see the face of the singer go, oh no, I did not think they were going to ask for that one. Yeah, you see the look of like, ah. Oh. <laughs> All right, I want to ask Sorry. I want to ask a question and this might be controversial and, and we can always edit it, but okay. we are looking at a screen of three very strong women. Yes, three very strong women in a business that is still, sorry to say, male dominated. Yep. Yeah. Do you feel that you have had all your career to work twice as hard just to keep up? And you don't have to answer this and you can answer it however you want to. I wouldn't How say keep up, I would say to prove yourself, like to just keep Yes, up. okay, that's a better way. Thank you, Carrie. Sorry, I'm in a sort of light and dark mm -hmm. situation here. Um, it's beautiful. There, I mean, what I would say, there have definitely been times where I feel that I, I've had to be a bit more creative with, with what I've done to either be in the conversation still or to have my work recognized so mm -hmm. even just to have like an input sometimes I think I've had to sort of think right how do I get into that and yeah. you know whereas I don't know maybe arguably if I was a man it wouldn't have been an issue I, it's hard to know but yeah. what the main way that I feel that I've dealt with it is by just trying to find a team of people that I really want to work with and that I know respect women and humans in general. Humans. Yeah. yeah, and you're right. You, you've been in three really great positions that with people who really respect. Yeah, uh, like John Murray, it was, you know, he really treated me as an equal. It's, and, you know, working with Alexander, it, as you know, mm -hmm. it's great. He, you know, he's he would never treat me like as no. something different just because I'm a woman. So I hope it changes. I hope that I hope all of this business really changes soon and that women are are thought of. Yeah, equally mm -hmm. um, and not just women, you know, everyone is treated equally. It's it's a, a business that really needed to change. And I think we're starting that process. I really do. Yeah. Hope so. Gosh, I really hope so. I hope it's not just a bunch of lip service that we've all been talking about for a year, you know, where we're sitting around waiting to get back to life as normal. But um, we'll see as Opera House is open, right? We shall see. Um, do you have time for one more question before we hit rapid fire? Oh. Or are we at one, do you mind? Or I don't know how many more questions. Oh, yeah, rapid fire. <laughs> rapid fire. Um, social media. How yes, important is a singer social media account and followers? How important is that to an opera house, to a casting director? Oh, uh, I think it depends on the casting director, probably. But uh, <laughs> to, for me, I mean, I like social media and I like looking at clips of things, but I, I, I don't really use social media as a casting tool. Mm -hmm. I, I will watch videos and online things and things that agents send me. And I use that as sort of part part of the picture of that singer 
Okay. Um, but I don't think it could ever really replace hearing that singer live. But do you think it 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 displays a bit of their personality? And do you yeah. think singer, singers should really think about how they portray themselves online? I mean, yeah, I think it can do, I think it do, can do a lot for um, like mar marketing purposes. Like it can, you can give a glimpse of the personality and it can get people excited about, you know, go, hearing, going to hear that singer and getting to know them a bit and follow them. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I, I think it works for, for singers who know how to do that and who have a gift for that. Um, and whether it's a gift or whether it's actually, you know, a strategy and a plan, uh, it's probably debatable. Um, but there are a big number of pitfalls. I mean, <laughs> the amount of times you'll think, why did this singer put this clip or allow this clip to be out? They'd sound awful. Like, this is uh, hello, are opera houses even putting up clips of singers yeah. sounding and not... And not representative, yeah. Oh yeah, I mean, and and then you you look at other social media feeds and you think, oh, this is this isn't really doing anything. It's just showing this. I don't know. I think there are pitfalls definitely, and I think it's for young singers. It's definitely some a, a skill that they need to acquire, um, or ask somebody about it and learn. Exactly. Yeah. And they can watch our video with Andrew Owsley, right? Oh yeah, that's coming. Um, do you ever equate hiring somebody with however many people they have on social media because it can help bring people to buy tickets to the opera? No. Okay. I'd That's love to do that. Mm -hmm. No, it's good to know. Good. Yeah. All right. I have one last question. Okay. What would you say is the hardest thing about being married to an opera singer? <laughs> Uh, come on it's funny it's funny we're all we're all weird animals right mm -hmm. the, well the hardest thing to like on a serious note the hardest thing is um just not being able to see them very much <laughs> the, i mean the best thing about 2020 was that i spent most of the year with my husband which was we i think we probably spent more time together last year than we had in the whole of our relationship before that <laughs> And you're still married. That that's yeah. kudos to you guys. Yeah, we enjoy each other's company. Thank goodness. He's adorable. He's yeah. really adorable. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right, rapid fire. fire. Rapid fire. Rapid fire. Woo! Okay. Okay. What's the most useless talent that you have? Useless talent. Useless. I am grade five discount recorder. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Five grades. I don't know why. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay. Love you. Okay. Go ahead. Three things you have to do every day. Oh, three things I have to do every day. I have to have a cup of tea. I have to FaceTime with my husband every day. Uh, and ooh, the third thing, I have a shower. Okay. There you go. Okay. Three things. Okay, what's the worst habit that you'll never break? Mm. Uh, worrying about everything too much, I think. Mm. I really try and stop. I've read lots of things about, I've worried about worrying. What? <laughs> 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 They tell you like it's they tell you to like schedule a portion of the day to take 20 minutes just to worry about all the things so then you don't have to think about worrying for the rest of the day. I love but, that. That's good. Oh, okay. It work. It doesn't work. Oh. It doesn't work. Yeah, there's gotta be another way to, to break that because yeah, then you just sit up at night and go like oh, okay, ding, 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 ding. <laughs> okay. What's the most rebellious thing you ever did as a teenager? <gasps> Ooh. Now, come on, that one's a mean one. <laughs> I, <laughs> the thing, just, ooh, I, uh oh, you don't have to answer it. If you no, don't no. Fuck. I, I was horrible as a teenager. I lied to my parents. I would, I would say, I, I remember specifically saying that I was going to fireworks night, but instead we went to the pub and got drunk. 
And then I could, then I remember walking back and we were saying, oh, well, we've got to come up with a believable story. So we've got to, you know, think about what exactly the fireworks were like and come up with some detail. We like concocted this whole thing. And my parents were like, okay. <laughs> so they obviously knew that I'd been in the pub. Yes. I, too. I got my mouth washed up with soap lying to her about where I was. So, And I feel awful about it now. I mean, horrible. But it um, made you who you are today. Teenagers are horrible sometimes. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Ooh. Um, I, if I wasn't doing this, I would like to do something with outdoors. So with nature or something, gardening. I'd be terrible at it, but something, <laughs> something where I wasn't in a building. Okay. It, after a while, sitting in dark theaters get, gets yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I know, especially at the Met too, your office was like subterranean in yeah, the I dark. I could see the daylight for months on end. At the Met. I mean, if people could see your view right now, maybe yeah. I'll take a picture of it and post it. It is stunning. It's amazing. <laughs> okay, so what fashion trend did you never get? There's probably there's probably a lot, but because I'm don't really I'm don't really follow trends so much. Okay. Because I actually feel that like there's a lot of things that just don't suit me. Ah. Um, so yeah, yeah, I don't know. I'd be interested. Okay, to what's the scariest thing you've ever done? How about oh, that? Sorry, what did you say? Oh, you said you'd be curious to what? You know your answers to that question. Fashion trends. That Bell you know. bottoms. Yeah, worse. Never got them. Never. Oh, I love bell bottoms. <laughs> That's because you're petite. <laughs> That's because you're like, like you're you're a wee thing, as as my, as my my British family would say. You're a wee little thing. <laughs> Carrie and I, you know, we're like tall and we're we're buxom ladies. So bell bottoms. Mm. You see, Same. that's the thing. I would never be able to wear anything like where you, it requires any kind of cleavage. Okay. Okay. I mean, I always said like my thighs um, came out of the womb touching. And so that does not work well. Thick, juicy thighs do not work well with bell bottoms. It's bad. No. Fire. <laughs> that's it. That's like a, that's a, <laughs> that's like fire happening between the yeah. legs for all of us, right? <laughs> all right, Carrie, then you ask. Okay. Okay. What is your favorite word? Mm. <laughs> In any language, I guess, right? Yeah. Any language. Oh. Meh. I really like, in German, I really like ausgezeichnet. What does that mean? I guess it means, I think, it means outstanding. Like, Ooh, really love that. Amazing. Okay, and then your least favorite word. My least favorite word. Mm. Pandemic. <laughs> yeah, bloody pandemic. Crev, oh. strike. Oh. All of those. All of those. What is your favorite cuss word in any language? Oh. Mm. You see, with swearing, I I think it's all about the emotion that goes into the word rather than the word itself. I agree. So I would say that, you know, shit is quite just a, a lame sort of word. But if you go shit. <laughs> then it can be really satisfying. <laughs> so if you invest in it, right? If you Yeah, you've got to invest. Yeah. Shit. I love that. Shit can be very satisfying. That's the hashtag <laughs> today. <laughs> <laughs> Carrie has one and 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 our I think our general, right? Our general favorite cuss word is is the F word, yeah. yeah. And and any variation of it <laughs> with a mother F or yeah, just that. Yeah, we're not PG rated, so don't worry. Yeah, yeah. So that ask the last one. Yeah, go ahead. So if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you enter through the pearly gates? Wow. Well, wow. Yeah, wow. Wow. <laughs> I mean, just the idea of God saying anything to me as I'm walking through the pearly gates is incredible. Just That's true. Him, I think is is uh, is enough. Wow. Okay, so we'll just go with wow. That's yeah. great. I love it. She's like, have you ever watched The Good Place? I just finished watching. Yes. It. Yes. 
So if God said to me, welcome to the good place, that would really freak me out. <laughs> oh, Thank so you. Good to see you. It's so good to see you too. And congratulations on the yes. job. Thank you. Yes. Absolutely. Amazing. Oh, well awesome. deserved and onward and upward. We needed more time just for general chatting. But... I agree with that. Please. Yes. With, Listen, with we are we... not in the office. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. Thank you. Stay safe. You too. Bye.